From APM Reports and The Washington Post, this is Historically Black. I'm Heaven Nagatu. And I'm Tracy Clayton. So in case you don't know who we are, Heaven and I have a pretty popular podcast. It's all right. It's, it's all right. cool. It's called Another Round with Heaven and Tracy. Check it out. But this week, we're lending a hand to Historically Black. So here's what's up. This fall, the Smithsonian's long-awaited National Museum of African American History and Culture opened in D.C. As part of its coverage of the story, the Washington Post invited folks across the country to submit photos of objects that represent their own personal and family connections to Black history. Each week, this podcast features one of those objects and the stories behind it. This week's podcast is about HBCUs, historically Black colleges and universities, and about a former slave who started his own college. My name is Deborah Clark Russell, and the uh, photograph that I submitted was a picture of me and my daughter, along with my great-great-grandfather, the founder of Alabama A&M University. The photo shows Russell standing by a statue of William Hooper Council in Huntsville, Alabama. Alabama A&M University refers to him as Alabama's best-kept secret. And I think after founding a university in 1875, he should no longer be a secret. Deborah Clark Russell's ancestor, William Hooper Council, was born into slavery in North Carolina in 1849. His parents were named William and Mary Jane. Council was the name of the white family that owned them. Council's father escaped to freedom in Canada when the boy was six. The rest of the family was broken up and carried to the Deep South by slave traders. Young William, his mother, and one brother were sent to Alabama. Two other brothers were sent elsewhere and never seen again. After the South lost the Civil War, Council began attending a school for blacks in Averyville, Alabama. It was run by Quaker missionaries from the North. Council was 17 years old. Later, Council worked days as a farm laborer and used his earnings to pay for books and for tutoring at night. Here's Eddie Davis Jr. He's an Alabama A&M graduate, and he's written a biography of William Hooper Council. Council speaking about his struggles for an education. Accordia says, I plowed once, three days for an old Greenleaf's arithmetic. Later, I walked three miles, three times a week in physics and chemistry and paid a learned professor 50 cent for each lesson. God forbid that anybody, white or black, should ever be forced to battle against such odds. The Civil War ended in 1865, and the 12 years that followed became known as Reconstruction. Union troops were still stationed in parts of the South, and radical Republicans controlled state governments. The Republicans were the party of Abraham Lincoln. African Americans had come out of slavery wanting land, economic opportunity. They wanted political rights and they wanted education. This is Jeff Norell, a historian at the University of Tennessee. He says that with Republicans in control, Blacks in the South gained a modicum of power for the first time. But white supremacists in the Democratic Party fought back viciously. It was an intensely hostile environment to Black people in general, and it was an especially hard attitude among whites against Black education. Remember, during slavery, it was illegal for slaves to learn how to read and write. It was also illegal to teach them. After emancipation, many Southern whites still objected bitterly to the notion of educating black people. One of the crucial tenets of a white supremacist uh, position was that education was wasted on African Americans, that education spoiled a good field hand. As he educated himself, William Hooper Council became committed to the idea of schooling for all African Americans. He got involved in Republican politics and pressed for expanded state government support of black schools and colleges. Problem was, Reconstruction only lasted about 12 years. Southern Democrats eventually clawed back much of their original political power, including in Alabama, and the Ku Klux Klan was terrorizing African Americans in many parts of the South. Historian James Horton of George Washington University says times were bleak for black people in Dixie. They can exercise very little social control even over their own communities. And so from the standpoint of the African American, this is not quite slavery, 
but it is only a few steps into freedom beyond slavery. So in this harsh environment, council had to curry favor with even the most racist of whites to raise state money for black schools. It will be readily admitted that the Negro is the most desirable of all races as a laborer. This is an actor reading from Council's vast body of writing about the role of Black people in the South and how to educate them. His message was pitched to white audiences of the day. He is kind, forgiving, and easily understood and managed. He is willing to work at almost any price. But he is ignorant, improvident, and unskilled. And it is to be regretted that his progress is slow in the cultivation of skill in the industries. But there are fruitful and encouraging signs in this direction. So, this might sound a little wild to modern ears, but Council was trying to win support from very hostile forces. In the 1880s, a former slave named Booker T. Washington was also raising money for a black school in Alabama. It would become the widely regarded Tuskegee University. Tuskegee was launched to educate black teachers as well as industrial and farm workers. And Washington would become one of the most influential black leaders of his time. Like counsel, Booker T. Washington also gave a lot of speeches aimed at convincing white races in power to support black schools. He and counsel competed with each other for funding. Some historians later criticized both men for being too accommodating of white prejudice. Booker T. Washington is trying to deal with this situation, and he's doing it in a way that he sees as a practical solution. Again, historian James Horton. And that is, he is trying to call upon the best in white American culture to say that we African Americans will do our part to build the New South if you will only give us an opportunity. And the opportunity he was asking for was not so much political opportunity, but more economic opportunity, at least at the bottom of the economic scale, at least to find a niche in the economic system of the South that will allow African Americans to survive. By the late 1870s, more than half a million black students were enrolled in Southern schools. With Democrats in power, council switched parties to join them. Remember, Democrats back then were more hostile to African Americans than Republicans. Many of council's black contemporaries viewed the switch as a betrayal, but supporters saw it as a practical move. And soon, council was appointed principal of a new state-funded school for black people in Huntsville. A school that would eventually develop into Alabama Agricultural and Mechanical College for Negroes. It taught carpentry, mattress making, and horticulture for men. Women studied sewing, hat making, and domestic sciences. At the time, council was just 25 years old. The three great civilizing refining agencies, the workshop, the schoolroom, and the church, are open to us. Let the Negro carry the pick in one hand and the olive branch of peace in the other. Alabama A&M was among dozens of schools launched at the time, schools that we now call historically black colleges and universities, or HBCUs. The majority of black colleges were created uh, shortly after the end of the Civil War, so after 1865. Mary Beth Gassman is a professor of higher education at the University of Pennsylvania. They started in church basements. They started in, you know, old schoolhouses. They started in people's homes. Anywhere people had a thirst for knowledge, knowledge was completely kept from African Americans unless they could find some way to teach each other. So they had a thirst for knowledge. From those modest beginnings, HBCUs grew in size and number over the decades. Today, there are more than 100 HBCUs in America. Many of them in the South. Um, and we can go full start around this way. Including Alabama a and um, Y'all know what majors or anything y'all will be interested in? Communications. Communications, okay. On a pleasant a autumn afternoon, program. a group of young people, mostly black but not all, line up for that college ritual, the campus tour. It's led by three energetic a and students. My name is Mia Flanagan. I'm a senior. I'm a speech pathology major from Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Raven New. I'm a business management major, junior, and I'm from Kansas City, Missouri. My name is Casey McCoy. I'm a senior civil engineer major from Mobile, Alabama. 
More than 5,500 students attend Alabama A&M. It still has programs in agriculture and mechanical trades, but the university also offers a wide range of other degrees. And more than 90% of undergraduates here are African American. Now, there have been a lot of headlines in recent years about the uncertain state of HBCUs. At a time when black students can go anywhere, how do HBCUs stay relevant and competitive? Mary Beth Gassman at Penn says most HBCUs are doing okay when it comes to admissions and finances. And she says many of them do a very good job teaching students who come from less advantaged backgrounds. The majority of their students, by and large, are low-income students. Uh, You're still getting, not all, but a good number of first-generation students. And then you could lop off about 25 HBCUs, and then if you looked at the re- the top 25, if you look at the rest, I think you're going to see um, some significant percentages of students who are underprepared. For many students, HBCUs offer a welcome sense of community and deep tradition, and that's why they choose to attend. Gassman says HBCUs are often better equipped than more conventional schools to help underprepared students succeed. They've developed special programs geared to help students who are academically behind catch up with their peers. And she says a number of HBCUs have worked to attract students of color from other groups, especially Hispanics and Asian Americans. Beyond that, Gassman says, it's hard to generalize about HBCUs. It isn't a good idea to think of them as all alike, because they're not. The one thing that they have in common is that they, at their core, they were all started to engage in racial uplift and support African Americans. Uh, as a freshman, you are going to have to take a music appreciation class, so this is where that will be held. Um, Back at the tour of Alabama a and uh, the group of prospective students comes to a site not seen on a lot of college campuses. Our founder and his wife were buried on campus. This, um, to the left of us, is where they are buried. He, uh, he died in 1909, and myth has it that his wife died in 1910 uh, because of a broken heart. William Hooper Council, the founding president of Alabama A&M, died at the age of 59. He had been in poor health for some time. Now, Tuskegee University's founder, Booker T. Washington, is a much more familiar name. He drew support from industrialists such as Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller. He advised U.S. presidents on race relations, and he's one of the most significant black leaders in history. There are schools, streets, and public buildings all across the country named for him. Compared to Washington, Council is more of a footnote to African-American history. As his great-great-granddaughter says, a best-kept secret. But William Hooper Council's legacy is not a footnote to the tens of thousands of African-Americans who have graduated from Alabama A&M over the past 141 years. All right, y'all, that's it for this week. You've been listening to Historically Black, a podcast collaboration of APM Reports and The Washington Post. It was produced by Stephen Smith and Kate Ellis and edited by Mary Beth Kirshner. We had production help from Kai Thomas, Larissa Anderson, Andy Cruz, Ryan Katz, Corey Schreppel, and Johnny Vince Evans. The Post staff includes Julia Carpenter, Veronica Tony, and Jessica Stahl. William Council was played by T. Michael Rambo, which is the coolest name I've ever heard. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> and our theme music is by X144. Also a great name. Another one of them. And hey, if you want to contribute to Historically Black's online museum of objects from African American history, go to WashingtonPost.com slash historically black to get your whole historicness on on the internet forever. Do it, do it, do it. Get do your it. historicness on the internet forever. We'll be back next week. I'm Tracy Clayton. I'm having a got to. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye.